Hello and welcome to the Learning Centre. In this short video we are going to discuss reading and interpreting graphs. We will discuss how to read graphs and also engage in numerical reasoning. Tables and graphs are both ways of easily representing large amounts of data. Tables are best used for reporting specific numbers, which is necessary when precise reporting is needed. Graphs are best to show changes in data sets over time, which is known as trends, and comparison across categories. Graphs are a method of visually representing data. This makes it easy to identify the story that the data is telling. In this way, we can identify patterns that may occur in the data. We are also able to identify any relationships that may occur. This is because a graph can help us to easily see the shape of the data through a visual representation. These graphs can then be used in a report or other document to support a point of view or argument and to help in the decision-making process across a range of problems or situations. Graphs are also a key method to support research studies and relay simply and clearly key findings. It is important to know how to read and also how to create graphs because they are the primary method we have of visualizing data. Graphs and tables can make exhaustive amounts of information clear and coherent. They are therefore a key tool that can be used to make decisions in an almost unlimited number of situations. One way they do this is to provide an effective comparison of a number of diverse variables, clearly and simply. They are therefore a key element in making a logical and evidence-based decision. In an educational context, they also enable us to ask and answer a number of comprehension questions relating to a data set. It is important to remember that a graph only tells part of the story of a data set. There are things that graphs simply cannot or do not show, and it is therefore up to the viewer to interpret the graph correctly. One skill that is helpful to develop is inference. To do this, we first need to identify what the graph shows and then ask ourselves, what else is there to know which is not explicitly shown here? So on this graph, I can infer that some learning occurred here. I can do this because I can see that at this point, the shape of the data changed. I cannot, however, know this for sure as this data is not shown in the graph. In a similar way, I can infer that traffic law knowledge is only useful to pass the test and is then discarded. I infer this again from the shape of the data which is represented in the graph. So now we have two types of data. First, what is explicit in the graph or what we can easily see. And secondly, what we can infer. So I can see here that men spent almost 40 hours in paid work in 2011. I can infer that men spent 113 hours of a week relaxing because I know that there are 168 hours in a week and that 55 of them were spent on work or childcare. If I were asked the question, on average, how many hours per week do parents spend on housework? I can answer the question by looking at the graph and making a calculation, even if that information is not explicitly shown. Types of data and types of graphs. Different types of data are represented in different ways. Categorical data is represented using column graph or a pie chart. Numerical data is represented using histograms or scatter plots and line graphs. Bar graphs are used for categoric, ordered, and discrete variables. Categoric variables are those described by words rather than numbers. For example, in our graph, our categories relate to resources. Ordered variables relate to categories that can be put in an order of some kind, such as cold, warm, hot, boiling, and so on. Discrete variables are those that can be described by whole numbers only. Pie graphs are used to compare the size of the relative parts that make up a whole. That is, they show proportion. Histograms show the frequency of an occurrence. They look like a bar graph, except that the bars have no space between them. This is so you can see the relationship between them easily. Line graphs and scatter plots relate to continuous variables. Continuous variables are those that can be described by any whole or part number, such as temperature at 12.5 degrees. How to read graphs. The first step is to identify what the graph is about. This information is in the title. And here we have average weekly library usage by course level. 
the next step is to identify the scale used in the graph. In this graph, we can see that each increment of the graph represents 2,000 visits to the library. Thirdly, we locate the information that is relevant to us. Note that time elements are usually on the x-axis and quantity is almost always on the y-axis. In this graph, we focus on one year on the x-axis and then one of the groups within that year. From the legend, we can see that these are diploma students in blue, undergraduate students in red, postgraduate students in green, and members of the public in purple. We read directly up the column we want to focus on until we reach the top. We then read straight across to the left and read the y-axis label. In this graph, we can see that data labels have been included at the top of each column for ease of use. Line graphs are useful for displaying data that changes over time. In this graph, we can see that the chart measures projected expenditure in billions of dollars from the period 2012-13 to 2016-17. The line represents the shape of the change. Here we can see an increase in expenditure. We can see a decrease in expenditure here. We can also see stability in expenditure here. Here we can easily note the peak expenditure. And we can work out the difference in expenditure between the start and the end of the period. If we draw a line from the start of the graph to the end point of the graph, we can see the change over time or the trend was upward, which represents an increase in expenditure. So let's have a go at answering some questions related to these graphs. The first thing I need to do is identify what's measured and I can see here that it is the number of university dropouts as indicated by the Department of Education 2011. The first section of this graphic has the rate or percentage of each state and territory in Australia and the second part of the graph narrows down to look at the universities within one state, in this case Victoria, as both a rate and a number. Let's look at the first question, which is, which state had the highest dropout rates in 2011? It's quite easy to identify on this graph that the state with the highest dropout rate was the Northern Territory. We can see it's somewhere near to 30%. The second question asks, which university had the highest number of dropouts? This information is contained in the bottom graph here. This graph has two parts and we need to identify which section shows us the number. So here we can say this right hand side is the number, whereas these are the rates or the percentages on the left. By looking at this section, we can see that Deakin has the highest number at around 830 students. The third question asks, which had the highest percentage? Again, here we need to ensure we focus on the correct element of the graph. So in this case, we're looking for the percentage or rate, the University of Ballarat has the highest percentage here. The fourth question may provide a higher level of difficulty to some students at first glance. The question asks, how many new students attended the University of Melbourne in 2011? This information is not explicitly marked in the graph. However, we can easily work it out because we know from the graph that around about 5% of the first year students at the University of Melbourne is equal to around about 300 students. By dividing 300 by 5, we can calculate that 1% is equal to 60 students. And that leads us to calculate that 100% would be equal to 6,000. So our answer is that there were approximately 6,000 new students who attended the University of Melbourne in 2011. The fifth question asks, what can we conclude about the quality of first year experience at the varying universities? This question is asking us to make an assumption that the university dropout rate is related to the quality of the first year experience at each university. Now, this information is not actually contained in the graph and in reality could be because of a number of different factors. However, if we were to assume that happy students stay at university and that this was a result of quality, we could argue that students in Victoria are most satisfied with their university experience and that of these, the quality may be best at the University of Melbourne and least at the University of Ballarat. 
Let's now turn to graph two. The first question asks, how much fat in a McDonald's cheeseburger? This is easy to answer. We can simply read the column headings to identify the relevant column for cheeseburger, which is here, and then identify the row for fat, which is on the left here. When we do, we can see that the corresponding number is 13.2 for one serve, and that the value is recorded in grams. So the answer for question one is 13.2 grams. The second question requires a little bit more thinking. It asks, how much does a triple cheeseburger weigh in grams? One way that we can work this out is using ratios. A ratio compares values. So I can see from the table that 100 grams of a triple cheeseburger contains 1,140 kilojoules of energy. That is written as 100 grams to 1,140 kilojoules. I can also see that one serve has 2,490 kilojoules. I am assuming here that one serve is equal to one burger. So we write our problem like this. So to work out the unknown quantity, we multiply by the known corners and divide by the third number. That is to say 100 grams multiplied by 2490 kilojoules and then divided by 1140 kilojoules and this gives us the answer of 218.42 grams therefore we know that a triple cheeseburger weighs 218.42 grams let's turn to the third example the first question asks us, in which year did the library have the highest average usage? This might seem like an easy question. If we rush our response or fail to read the graph correctly, we can easily make a mistake here. A superficial glance at the graph might elicit the response of 2014 as the highest column is in this time frame. However, if we understand that the column headed with the number 14,555 is only one category within the time frame, we realize that this is a foolish error. By adding together the categories within each time frame, it can be easily seen that 2016 has the highest number of usages. Question two asks us to delve more deeply into the knowledge contained in the graph. The question says, if we assume that 60% of the diploma students were female, then how many more female usages than male usages occurred in 2016 than in 2013? To answer this question, we first have to assume that library usage is the same between males and females. We then identify the data related to 2016 and then identify the diploma students' data. In this graph, that is the blue column headed with the number 12,000. We know that of this number, 60% relates to female usage. So we multiply 12,000 by 0.6 and we now have the figure 7,200. We do the same for the data relating to 2013. Again, we multiply the diploma figure, in this case 4,500 by 0.6. We obtain the figure of 2,700. Our last step is to look at the difference between the two scores. The difference between 7,200 and 2,700 is 4,500. So we know that 4,500 more female usages occurred in 2016 than 2013. Let's look at the last graph example. This graph contains information about enrollments by gender at universities represented as a percentage. For the purpose of this exercise, the line representing males has been removed from this graph. The first thing to note about this graph is that as the female proportion increases, the male proportion decreases. There is an inverse relationship here. So while the line representing males is not explicitly shown here, it is possible to answer question about males in the same way that we can about females. For some people, this information is missed as they may misunderstand what the graph is actually showing. It is therefore important to take some time to understand a graph before attempting to answer questions about it. Once we clearly understand what is represented in the graph, it becomes quite easy to answer the questions relating to it. So here we can see that the rate of enrollments is around about 20% for females in 1950. That means that all of this here is male enrollments up to 100 percent 
On the other hand, as the proportion rises in 2013 to almost 60%, the male proportion decreases. So once we understand that about this graph, it's quite easy to answer these questions. So question one says, in which year did the same proportion of male and female students attend university in Australia? We know that the same proportion will mean 50%. So by looking at the graph, we can easily see that this occurred in approximately 1986. We can answer the second question in a similar way. Visually, we can see that two thirds of the graph above the line occurs in 1971. However, we should also note here that one third is equal to 33.33%. So it actually occurs a few years later in approximately 1973. In this short video, we have reviewed how to read graphs and how to interpret them. And we have also discussed some questions that may be used to analyze what graphs show. In summary, the steps to remember are 1. Identify what the graph shows. 2. Identify the type of data. Is it categorical or is it numerical? 3. Locate the scale, measurements and variables on the graph. 4. Identify explicit data. 5. Identify what may be inferred from the graph. And 6. Apply numerical reasoning.